My name is Jill Hazerbrook. I am the nursing education coordinator for Three South Front, CCU, PMD, ECHO, Cardiac Rehab, Stress Lab, and Cath Lab Holding. I am here today to talk to you about sepsis. First, I'd like to review the objectives. We want to identify the signs and symptoms of early and late sepsis. We want to define each stage of sepsis based on clinical presentation and define at least two nursing and medical interventions for patients with sepsis. The first several slides here will talk about prevalence and how big of an issue sepsis is for not only our country, but internationally. A couple statistics I would really like to point out on this slide are that 80% of sepsis cases begin outside of the hospital. Patients who survive sepsis also have long-term side effects, um, physical, psychological, and cognitive disabilities, and this is a huge economic burden. In the United States alone, research suggests that sepsis costs us over $62 billion a year, and that's from a recent study, I believe, 2019 or 20. The next few slides are some bar graphs where you'll see some comparisons. This first one is um, how severely ill patients with sepsis are versus patients without sepsis. And so as you can see from that blue bar, that's the patients with sepsis, that they are more severely ill than those with any other diagnosis within the hospital. This next one shows the difference between males and females. Now, they're pretty equal among each age group. The prevalence of sepsis is going to be near the same for males and females, but as you can see, the prevalence does increase with age, okay? So more elderly per people are being diagnosed with sepsis than younger populations. This last one is the average length of stay for patients with sepsis versus non-sepsis, okay? So how long they're staying in the hospital with these diagnoses. Again, clear to see that it's significantly longer for patients with sepsis. And as we all know, this can also increase patient risks for other hospital-acquired conditions um, and is also a financial burden as well. The next thing of note is the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. This is an international program and it is a joint effort between the Society of Critical Medicine here and the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine. It started in 2002. Um, they get together, use um, evidence-based research to uh, provide guidelines to improve diagnosis and treatments for patients with sepsis. This is ongoing um, to help uh, international hospitals with these patients. Next is a nice video here that does a good review and overview of sepsis, and then we'll further talk about the different stages of the continuum as we continue through the PowerPoint after. What is sepsis? Sepsis is a continuum of systemic or widespread infection in the bloodstream that begins with bacterial invasion and can lead to multiple organ failure. In sepsis, a breach of the host barrier often in the skin or mucous membranes, kicks off a dysregulated immune response in the host. Inflammatory mediators cause vasodilation and increased capillary permeability. These effects result in hypotension or low blood pressure. They activate the coagulation cascade and the complement cascade. The immune response involves the release of pro-inflammatory mediators that cause detrimental physiological effects such as clotting in the blood vessels, causing blockage of blood flow and poor tissue perfusion and tissue damage. Risk factors for sepsis include an existing wound, such as a pressure-associated injury, a traumatic wound, or a chronic non-healing wound, or infection, such as a kidney or lung infection. Other risk factors include a hospital or ICU admission, which puts a patient more at risk for hospital-acquired infection immune system deficiencies, such as HIV or cancer, recent surgeries, indwelling medical devices like central lines or urinary catheters, very young or very old age, chronic disease, or genetics. General clinical manifestations for sepsis. Sepsis will begin with general nonspecific symptoms such as malaise and fever. However, as the inflammatory response and tissue damage progresses, we will observe hypotension and tachycardia from the vasodilation and capillary permeability. Edema from the capillary permeability, tachypnea and hypoxemia due to tissue damage and poor tissue perfusion. 
and low urine output due to poor perfusion and kidney damage. Laboratory results will show an increased white blood cell count with a greater number of young immature white blood cells, also known as a left shift. Increased inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and erythrocyte sedimentation rate, markers of hyperperfusion such as increased serum lactate, and markers of organ damage such as increased glucose, increased creatinine, and increased bilirubin. Generally, we will see positive blood cultures as well. There will be signs of impaired coagulation, such as increased bleeding times, INR, PTT, and high or low platelet count depending on the timing. Sepsis occurs on a continuum, starting with infection and ending with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or MODS, and then potentially death. Initially, a localized infection occurs with localized inflammation. If not treated, this can cause a widespread inflammatory reaction called Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, also known as SIRS. A SIRS diagnosis is made if two or more of the following occur. A temperature of greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, a heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, a respiratory rate over 20, a PaCO2 of less than 32, a white blood cell count over 12,000 or less than 4,000, or greater than 10% bands. Sepsis is diagnosed if there is a diagnosed source of infection and the patient meets SIRS criteria. SIRS may occur without an infection as inflammation can occur for a number of reasons. Severe sepsis is accompanied by evidence of hypotension or hypoperfusion indicating lactic acidosis. An SBP of less than 90 or SBP drops greater than or equal to 40 millimeters of mercury of normal. Hypotension results in a decrease of oxygen to the tissues, causing anaerobic metabolism and lactate production. In this stage, expect elevated lactate, low pH, low bicarbonate, and low blood pressure. In septic shock, hypotension remains despite adequate fluid resuscitation. For example, if a patient diagnosed with severe sepsis received a fluid bolus and had no improvement in their blood pressure, they would be considered to be in septic shock. Finally, Multiple Organ Dysfunction Syndrome. MODS is diagnosed when septic shock is accompanied by evidence of two or more organs failing. For example, we may see respiratory failure as impaired oxygenation and ventilation that requires mechanical ventilation, liver impairment that causes jaundice or elevated liver enzymes, kidney impairment, neurological impairment evidenced by decreased mental status, and cardiac impairment as cardiac arrest. If left untreated, MODS can result in death. So as I said, that was a nice overview of sepsis, its pathophysiology. So first I want to talk about the challenge in identifying sepsis. Um, why is it so difficult to identify these patients? First is that the signs and symptoms can be masked by other illnesses and um, other comorbidities that the patient may have. There is also not a gold standard test or diagnosis for sepsis. Many people do think that lactic acid or lactate levels are a gold standard. It's just one tool in a lot of other tests and things that we do to identify sepsis. Lactic acid can be elevated in many other diagnoses, including um, burns, rhabdomyolysis, and DKA. Um, lastly, the presentation may differ depending on different patients. So we want to keep that in mind when we're assessing our patients. This is a nice picture to capture the differences in um, some of the common infections that you'll see with patients with sepsis and then the signs and symptoms of sepsis on the side there. Sometimes these images just stick with us better than words, so that's why I've added this slide here. Um, among adults, you see 35% of sepsis infections came from lung infections, 25% came from UTIs, 11% come from gut infections, 11% come from skin infections. Um, of course, these are not the only infections that can cause sepsis. I have seen them from an abscessed tooth or an ingrown hair. Um, anything that can lead to an infection can lead to sepsis. Again, key, always keep in mind the signs and symptoms of sepsis. This is gonna be really important for when we're assessing our patients. Shivering fever or very cold, extreme pain or discomfort, clammy or sweaty skin, confusion or disorientation, shortness of breath or a high heart rate. This is only a few of those. 
as I said, we're going to review the sepsis continuum. I know the video did a good job of thoroughly reviewing, but I want to make sure that you're, you're seeing this again so that hopefully it sticks a little bit better. What I want to point out in this screen is the associated mortality rate at the top there in yellow. Um, with sepsis uncomplicating, you have a mortality rate of 10%. With severe sepsis, it goes all the way up to 35%. Septic shock, it's 50%. So you're seeing that mortality rate um, increase pretty significantly with each stage of the continuum. First stage is SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. As the video noted, you can see this with other diagnoses besides sepsis. To, so to ensure that it's sepsis, you would need SIRS criteria plus a known infection, okay? So those SIRS criteria are listed up there again, high temp, high heart rate, low, excuse me, high temp or low temp, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, high or low white blood cell count, or an increase um, of 10% or more bands, which is those immature white blood cells. Your body's in overdrive trying to make those white blood cells to fight infection. Um, so there's a lot of them, them um, being made at that time. The next stage is going to be severe sepsis. This is sepsis plus new organ failure. New organ failure um, can be a lot of different things. So cardiovascular of the heart, that's going to be a low blood pressure or a drop in their blood pressure from baseline of 40 or more. Um, respiratory, this is going to be these patients that come in and all of a sudden need oxygen and they don't wear it at home. Or even the patient who wears oxygen is now from three liters to six liters, okay? That SVO2 less than 90%. Renal patients, um, it's difficult to identify sepsis in if that renal is going to be one of their identifiers of organ failure, okay? If it's a non-renal patient or a patient who does not already have renal failure, we're looking for um, an increase, or excuse me, a decrease in urine output less than a half a milliliter per kilogram in two hours, um, or an increase in that creatinine. For metabolic, you'll see that lactic acid be greater than two. For CNS, um, central nervous system, you're going to see a change in mental status, so new confusion. Again, this poses a challenge in that elderly population where they come in with dementia, and you can't identify if this is, you know, if they do have new mental status changes. Your platelets could be less than 100,000, INR elevated, and this would be, again, in those patients who are not on anticoagulant therapy because you would not be able to distinguish the difference there. And then um, hepatic or liver failure, you'll see an increase in bilirubin. The next two stages, um, septic shock. Septic shock is severe sepsis, which we just talked about, plus persistent hypotension, okay? These patients are the patients that their blood pressure drops. You give them fluids, which is 30 mLs per kilogram, which we will talk about a little bit later. And even after you give them that fluid, they are still hypotensive. Their blood pressure is still low, so they are not responding to fluids anymore. And or their lactate is greater than or equal to 4 millimoles per liter. Okay, septic shock can progress to multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, which has a very high mortality rate. This is a failure of two or more organ systems. MODS is a precursor to death in sepsis, and with each organ failure, um, you get an increase of 20% for mortality. So 20% increase for each organ that failures as you progress to MODS. The next couple slides, I'm going to show you some things that you're going to see in EPIC, okay? We do require nurses every shift to do a sepsis navigator screening, okay? So you'll see on the right side of your screen here, this is a screenshot of the sepsis navigator. This goes through a series of questions. It's asking you, does the patient have a known or suspected infection? Do they have two or more of the SIRS criteria? And you just walk through it every shift, okay? In addition to that navigator, we also have this BPA or best practice alert that will fire if your patient meets SIRS sepsis criteria, okay? This could happen based on your sepsis navigator and how you filled it out, but it also could alert you when a new lab result comes back and those platelets are less than 100,000 or that lactate is greater than two. This will automatically update and pull that information and alert you of that. So when you log into that patient, every single provider that logs into that patient will get this red screen that pops up saying, you need to look into this further. This patient may have sepsis. So it walks through what 
the um, recent clinical data is. And then at the bottom, you have an acknowledged reason, okay? Be sure to choose those appropriately. You're either treating the associated infection already, okay? You're completing further clinical review, which means maybe you're gonna discuss this with um, the physician. You're going to call a code sepsis, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, maybe the patient, this has already been discussed and we know clearly the patient does not have sepsis, okay? These different SERS criteria are from other things, anxiety, um, pain, renal failure. Though, you know, those three things combined would alert you that this patient meets SERS criteria. Um, and then for people who are just going to look at the chart, they would use that chart review only. Typically as the bedside nurse, that's not something you're gonna be choosing, okay? This is different in ED, okay? This screen that is up right now is for inpatients. This next one is for ED, okay? It's just different because in the emergency department, you have the emergency doctor right there for you. We're going to be treating these patients immediately as soon as this is identified. Versus inpatient, we're going to call a code sepsis, which again, we'll talk about later. So you'll see on the right, that's that sepsis screening for our nurses each shift. Again, a series of questions that you'll go through, fill in the blanks there with their vital signs as appropriate. And then the left side, that allows you for your patients that you do identify sepsis in to um, document quickly the interventions that you are initiating for these patients. Okay, moving on for our inpatients. I said code sepsis a couple times already. If you get the sepsis alert in EPIC, okay, or you just think as a nurse that you have concerns for EPIC for this patient, you are going to call a code sepsis, okay? To do that, you dial 222 and you say code sepsis. This alerts the RRT team or the rapid response team. That is a team of a nurse um, who um, came from ICU and a resident, okay? When I say came from ICU, excuse me, they used to work in ICU and now they are an RRT nurse, so they have that critical care experience, all right? And they bring a physician with them to be able to write orders in EPIC. They come and see the patient. Um, this is your badge buddy that you have if you wanna look at it while we review this, but when they do come to see the patient and they identify this as a sepsis concern, what they're gonna do is assist you or um, in initiating this one hour bundle. Okay, which is expected on all sepsis patients. They're going to be drawing a lactic level for you. They're going to be doing blood cultures, which have to be done before giving antibiotics. And the physician is going to be ordering those broad spectrum antibiotics as well. If the patient is hypotensive, they're going to be giving them those fluid boluses that we talked about, 30 mLs per kilogram. Okay, if they continue to be hypotensive, they're gonna apply vasopressors and this patient needs to go to the um, critical care unit. So um, again, most often what you're gonna expect from that RRT team and that critical care experienced nurse and that doctor that's coming along is to draw that those labs, probably more than just a lactate, also a WBC, maybe coags, things like that. They're gonna get those blood cultures for you and they're gonna order those antibiotics, okay? If you do not get those antibiotics within a half an hour of those orders being placed, you need to call pharmacy and alert them, okay? Those antibiotics, as long as the providers are using the order set in Epic to order the broad spectrum antibiotics, they are stat and they should be getting to you quickly, okay? This is the only thing that can save these patients and hopefully prevent them from progressing, all right? Um, Alert pharmacy, let them know you need it stat. This is a sepsis patient. Sometimes you may need to tell that provider that they need to reorder it stat. As soon as you get that antibiotic, you need to administer it if that RRT, RRT team is no longer there, okay? Uh, the backside of that badge buddy is just the uh, sepsis continuum if you needed reminders of that. And management, you know, we've talked about this throughout the whole presentation, but um, the first step in this is just continually screening our patients, which we do every shift in EPIC, okay? Always looking to see if there's an infection and if they meet SERS criteria. The second step is if they are meeting that SERS criteria, that sepsis, we want to screen for organ dysfunction because that is key, that is identifying that they are progressing, that that sepsis is progressing, and what else do we need to do right now to support them to allow those antibiotics to do their job? Okay, initiating that one hour bundle when appropriate. Step three, identify and manage hypotension. Okay, again, as they progress down this continuum, if they need 
Uh, fluid boluses, you're doing that. And if they need vasopressors, you're doing that. Okay. Again, these patients who are in need of vasopressors and are critically ill, they will be transferred to the critical care for um, closer monitoring and supportive care. I'm going to go through some questions here. Okay. Test your knowledge. A 91 year old patient, Jim, was admitted to your unit with the following parameters His blood pressure is 92 over 88, heart rate is high at 142. Respiratory rate is high at 24. Temp is high at 100.9. White count is high at 17,000. And Glasgow Coma Scale, which is normally 15, is 12, and that is related to new confusion. Okay, during your initial assessment, his family states that he saw his PCP two weeks ago and was being treated for a kidney infection. Jim most likely has. I'll give you a couple seconds here to try and figure this out. Severe sepsis, okay? He has severe sepsis because of that new confusion, okay? That counts as uh, one organ failure. Moving on, your 35-year-old patient, Kendra, is three weeks post-appendectomy, who was admitted to your unit last night for rule-out sepsis. During the night, Kendra received two liters of fluid and IV antibiotics after blood cultures were collected. Her current morning parameters are as follows. Her blood pressure is low, 88 over 48. Heart rate high, respiratory rate high, temp high, SpO2 low, she's on six liters, white count high, lactate high. As an astute RN, you would classify Kendra's condition as shock. Okay, this is because she has received those fluid boluses, that 30 milliliters per kilogram, and she is still hypotensive, okay? So this is saying that she is in septic shock. She needs to be on vasopressors and transferred to a critical care unit. What is the provider's role in these patients, okay, in, in sepsis in general throughout the hospital? They are expected to have knowledge of evidence-based guidelines for sepsis in these patients. They're expected to initiate orders based on guidelines. Again, antibiotics, key here. Antibiotics are the only thing that can actually treat sepsis. Everything else that we do is just supportive care to allow those antibiotics time to work, okay? So what typically happens is they're going to order broad spectrum antibiotics. They're going to wait for those cultures to come back and then order appropriate antibiotics based on those culture results. They're also expected to communicate and collaborate as always. Acknowledge that sepsis is a medical emergency. If you feel like you're getting pushback from, um, from a, a provider about this, again, call that code sepsis. They're always going to um, help you and support you throughout this. Um, and use a sepsis screening tool and order sets. Again, the providers are to be using these to identify sepsis in our patients. The nurse's role is gonna to be to do those routine screenings that we've talked so much about. Every shift we're checking our patients and of course throughout our shift as we do assessments and we see changes. Always keep that in the back of your mind as something that might be going on with your patients, especially those who already have a diagnosed infection. Um, Know the signs and symptoms of sepsis. There's that nice picture again on the side there. Um, call a code sepsis when it's appropriate. If you're not sure, please call a code sepsis. Okay, I'd rather have them come. And Manuela, who will give you a presentation later, um, one of our RRT nurses, she will say the same thing. If you need support, uh, then you need to call RRT in any situation, um, especially in these sepsis ones. If you don't know for sure, call RRT, they will come do the assessment and initiate orders as appropriate. Administer antibiotics as soon as possible following the cultures. Again, those blood cultures should be done before you give those antibiotics, which should be given as soon as possible. Then we're gonna fulfill all other doctor's orders as appropriate. A couple more questions. Which of the following mechanism contributes to hypotension and septic shock? I discussed in the video and it is peripheral vasodilation, okay? Last question, a 70-year-old female arrived on your unit from the emergency department. The patient is admitted for one week of persistent fatigue, change of mental status, diarrhea, and vomiting. Past medical history includes diabetes, type two, and heart disease. Cultures of stool, urine, and lactate were sent and broad spectrum IV antibiotics administered. The following parameters are, low blood pressure, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, normal temperature, 
normal SpO2, hemoglobin is low, white count is high, and then you see your BUN, creatinine, lactic, okay? As an astute RN, your immediate treatment would include IV fluid resuscitation, okay? That is because that blood pressure is low, okay? Um, we want to give that 30 milliliters per kilogram for that persistent hypotension. If that continues after that IV fluid resuscitation, then again, we would start them on vasopressor therapy, which is that A, and transfer them to critical care. But we always want to try fluids first. You would never go first to vasopressors. This is a great image of an acronym that um, only recently we have seen um, from sepsis.org or the Sepsis Alliance. When you're thinking about sepsis, maybe if you can keep this acronym in mind of time, it will help key you into the things that you should be looking at. So temperature of high, you know higher or lower, do they have an infection? Do they have any mental status changes or mental decline? And are they seeming extremely ill in any way? So severe pain, discomfort, shortness of breath, things like that, okay? Again, just another acronym to throw at you to maybe keep in your mind to help with these diagnoses. Last thing we're gonna do is watch a video. Um, it's about a young lady who had very severe sepsis and what she went through. Our daughter Erin was 23. She had just graduated from the University of Georgia. She was going on to graduate school, University of South Florida. She went in for a simple hemorrhoidectomy on a Thursday. Five days later, she was gone to something I had never heard of. Many death certificates list the cause of death as cancer. Many of those patients die of sepsis. Many death certificates list the cause of death as complications of heart disease and the cause of death is sepsis. Many death certificates list the cause of death as complications of pneumonia and the cause of death is sepsis. According to a recent poll, close to half of all Americans have never heard the word sepsis. And in fact, I practiced dentistry for 25 years and I didn't know anything about sepsis. We have more than 1.6 million cases of sepsis annually in this country. And of those cases, nearly 20% wind up dying. There is an epidemic that is occurring in sepsis. This has been increasing in the number of cases by about 9% per year. Certain groups of people seem to be at higher risk for sepsis. That includes people like the very young, elderly people, people with chronic conditions like cancer or liver disease. People who are over the age of 65 are 11 times more likely to have a hospitalization associated with sepsis than someone who's less than 65. But there should be no mistake, sepsis is an equal opportunity killer. It kills the young, it kills the old, it kills the sick, it kills the healthy. Sepsis is really a toxic response to an infection. So your body is constantly inundated with uh, challenges by microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi. And you have a extensive system in your body to try and keep that bacteria from becoming an infection. The problem is, is that body can also go haywire. And so as a result, instead of protecting you, your body actually starts trying to kill you. The immune system is mobilized to action like an army. And the white blood cells are firing bullets at the bacteria or at the invaders. And that's fine when the bullets are, are, are targeting the bacteria, but it becomes a real problem when the bullets start flying everywhere and you get collateral damage on the patient's own organs. And this becomes a catastrophe. So you may hear a number of terms that are used in the hospital around sepsis. There's sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock. Sepsis is at its basic heart, this notion of having systemic inflammation due to an infection. In some instances, sepsis progresses to the point that people's organs fail. When your organs fail or aren't working correctly, this is called severe sepsis. The most serious form of sepsis is when your blood pressure drops as a result. This we call septic shock. Aaron went in on a Thursday for elective surgery, hemorrhoidectomy, just a routine surgery. I'd had it done before. And on Friday, they dismissed her for the weekend. Well, everything seemed okay until Sunday night, and all of a sudden they had a term for the worse and the pain level went up. Well, that's completely contrary to healing phase. 
So my wife took her back to the hospital, but they kept her Sunday night. I went in Monday to see what's going on. And I could tell something was wrong. I mean, I could see her blood pressure was off, very low. Her heart rate was up. I said, where is the doctor? He said, well, he's down there. I said, well, go get him. And he walked in. He said, I think she's septic. It's the first time I heard the word septic. She had the infection when she came home on Friday night, but they did not give antibiotics because they told her they were concerned it would cause diarrhea. So if she would have had the code sepsis that we referred to, that is fluids and antibiotics on a Friday night, this was all preventable. And it's such a shock for that to occur and someone die from something you've never heard of. And that changed my life. I was with her when she died. She looked at me. And said, with her eyes, can't you do something bad? If doctors treated sepsis as a medical emergency in all instances, as many as 50% of deaths occurring now wouldn't happen. And so that's 125,000 people surviving every year who would have otherwise died. We think that one of the ways to emphasize the need for treating sepsis like a medical emergency is to refer to this in the same way that we refer to other medical emergencies, which is as a code. If you're in a hospital, you might hear a code blue. That means that there's a team that responds to someone whose heart has stopped. We're trying to promote the notion of a code sepsis. And what code sepsis is, take this disease seriously, suspect it, administer early antibiotics, administer fluids, and get the help you need to provide the care for the patient. Reducing mortality in sepsis is as easy as getting antibiotics into patients. What we also know is that your mortality goes up by about 8% for every hour that passes without antibiotics. Unfortunately, there's not a single sign or symptom that really tells you you have sepsis. But I think there are some warning signs that people can look out for. These can include things like problems breathing, a fast heart rate, either a high temperature or chills, feeling dizzy or lightheaded, particularly when you stand up, and problems with changes in the level of consciousness. And this can include either confusion or possibly being difficult to arouse. If you're concerned about sepsis, one of the things to do is when you talk to your doctor, say, I'm worried about sepsis. That cues the doctor to think about this as a problem and do further testing. The first time I felt the sore throat coming on, it was a Friday night. It was just like a slight soreness in my throat, nothing major. The next morning I woke up and it was the worst sore throat of my life. I actually could barely talk. I was having trouble breathing. I started running a really high temperature. I started throwing up blood. That's when I realized it was time to go to the emergency department. And at that time, the, the thought was that she probably just had a viral illness like a cold leading to a sore throat. Over the next couple days, however, she got worse. Um, had increase in confusion, noticed her skin was mottled or had a blue discoloration, and wound up coming to the hospital a second time. When I was admitted to the ER, they reported that I was already in septic shock. I had H1N1, I was in renal failure. In Jen's case, her sepsis led to the formation of small blood clots in small blood vessels throughout her body. As a result of that, she didn't get enough blood flow to her extremities, and that led to gangrene, which is tissue dying. And I do remember looking at my hands and seeing that they were black and they were curled into like a claw because they had died, but not understanding what that meant. And also seeing my feet and toes and they were black. As a result of that, she required amputations. I remember my mom coming into my room and saying, it's time for you to go to your surgery. And I just started crying because I felt like I wasn't going to make it through the surgery. And there was so much I wanted to tell my mom, but I couldn't talk at the time. So I just said, I'm sorry. It's hard to really understand how sick she was. Her family was called in multiple times to her bedside because the doctors all thought she was going to die within minutes. And she was as close to death as anyone can be. It was extremely touch and go for months. 
she just slowly started getting better, but it still took her months to recover. The great unknown is the number of people who survive sepsis, but are significantly disabled as a result. And those disabilities can be obvious, things like amputations, but they also can be things that are hidden, like problems with thinking, memory, calculations, some even suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. We feel happy that they've survived, but they're still carrying the scars around with them for the rest of their lives. Well, I want to share my story because I've always wanted to help people, and I think this is a good way. I've always had that drive, but now it's in me even more. It makes me feel good if just one person knows what sepsis can do and how important it is to get treatment for it immediately so that there aren't grave consequences. And it all comes down to hope. That is, hope from shared responsibility that an informed public can work with their health care providers to reduce the deaths and disability from sepsis. The public will have to be empowered to demand and ask for early treatment. They must show that they're concerned about it and you always have to have an advocate with you checking everything is done. It is possible to improve the treatment and the survival from sepsis in the future. Will we be able to prevent any patient with sepsis from dying? Probably not. But will we be able someday to significantly improve the mortality rate of severe sepsis? Absolutely yes. But we're not there yet. We have a ways to go. However, this is a disease we could affect today. We don't need new scientific discoveries to reduce the mortality rate by 50%, to cut the number of people dying in half. All this takes is us doing a better job. So I find that to be a very sad but powerful video about the impact that we can have even as nurses at the bedside in identifying sepsis and hoping to prevent patients from going through something like that. Thank you very much for your time today.